time once again for the post-prison education program. And we are joined live in the studios here by Ari Cohn, executive director and founder of the post-prison education program, and Jenny Gruenberg, who is with NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, Washington State chapter. And she is the youth outreach coordinator there. And we're going to be talking about uh, associated issues with uh, with Jenny's organization. Ari and Jenny, thank you for coming in, spending time with us again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, uh, Ari, why don't, um, why don't you begin, if, right. if you would. So we were, um, were doing this town hall event uh, October 9th with uh, flying Pete Early in from Washington, D.C. to keynote. And, I, and because that's all about mental illness, I wanted uh, NAMI involved. And um, I'd actually been on a panel at a national conference for NAMI that happened to be in Seattle a few years ago, and I called the guy, Ron Holmberg, and he's no longer there. He's retired, right? He's consulting with NAMI at, and uh, met some of their new people and was introduced by email to Jenny. And uh, then we met at the office about a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. and, and she spent about an hour and a half listening to a an old man yet run her run her ears off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> it know? was more interesting than he makes it sound. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and and then I asked Jenny if if they would partner with us, if Nami would partner with the post prison education program on, on for the town hall event. Uh, and then I asked if she'd like to be on this radio show with us, and uh, and the answers were all yes. And um, and then we talked a lot about uh, your new position with NAMI and what you do and what what your background is. And I so I thought a, a great way to start out today would be uh, Jenny 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 went to Whitman, which is kind of cool, and, and Walla Walla uh, has had exposure with the Washington State Penitentiary, the Department of Corrections, that community down there, mental illness. Uh, and so I thought it'd be really cool to have you talk about you and your college background and how you came to be with NAMI and how you came to care about these issues and uh, all of that, in including Whitman, the Walla Walla community and, and, and so on. So you're on. All right. Well, uh, so I'm Jenny Gruenberg and I am the Youth Outreach Coordinator for NAMI Washington, um, a new position that just started at the organization and I've been there since April. Um, it's been great. I've loved working for them, loved seeing the way that mental illness and mental health issues intersect with so much that I'm passionate about education, criminal justice, um, kind of everything. It has a, has a piece in everything. Um, so I can just talk a little bit about NAMI to start. Um, so NAMI, as, um, as Mike introduced in the beginning, is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It's the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. And the heart of NAMI is building community and sharing lived experience and using those pieces um, to sort of, again, to build that community and to... Um, sort of create uh, a shared experience around mental illness and to elevate those issues to find support. So a lot of what I do in my role is I'm overseeing all of the youth outreach that youth outreach programming that NAMI does. So um, I have two programs specifically that I oversee. The first is called Ending the Silence and it's a mental health educational presentation that's designed to be given in middle and high schools throughout Washington State. Um, there are two, it's a two presenter presentation, um, a lead presenter who gives an educational PowerPoint presentation on mental, um, mental illness and mental health. And then there's a young adult who shares their personal story um, of recovery so that there's that personal piece 
students are really typically engaged with the presentation and being able to see someone who's been able to sort of become stable through their mental illness and have success. Um, so I oversee the programming of Ending the Silence throughout Washington State, working with our 19 affiliates to ensure that the program is um, sort of up and running in each of them and that we can provide this service throughout Washington. Um, the other piece of my job is to work um, with the NAMI on Campus program. And um, the NAMI on Campus program is um, sort of working to establish mental health interest clubs on college campuses throughout Washington State. We have two active clubs currently, one at Western Washington University and one at UW Tacoma. Um, but we're looking to expand and to have more. Um, but really the point of the club is to raise campus awareness about around mental illness and mental health issues, reduce stigma, um, have events that are put on by the club, and also to um, sort of provide a supportive environment for students to discuss mental health issues. So those are the two programs that I oversee in my role as Youth Outreach Coordinator. Um, and that's been, I've loved it. It's been great. Can you talk about Whitman and your college career in Walla Walla and how you interacted with the community down there and how that sort of led to where you're at now and what your interests are now? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I attended Whitman from 2013 to 2016 and then I stayed in Walla Walla the year after I graduated and worked for Blue Mountain Action Council, which is a local nonprofit there. Um, when I was a student, I immediately jumped into the sociology department, and that was my major. And I had amazing professors who tapped me into resources within Walla Walla so that I um, could immediately get involved. Um, I started volunteering through the Walla Walla Juvenile Justice System, or the Ju Juvenile Justice Center, as a um, community accountability board member, and really enjoyed that, working with the diversion program. Um, and if, for those of you that aren't familiar with community accountability programs or CAB programs, um, they're a way to sort of divert juveniles away from the system. Um, so the juvenile will come in with their parent, they'll sit in front of a board of volunteer members, and I was one of those volunteers, and they'll um, will read the police report about the event that happened, and then the youth and the parent will sort of discuss their perspective, what was going on in their life, um, so that we can then um, decide what a fair sort of penance for them is. And that typically involves community service, writing apology letters, um, allowing them to be reflective through essay writing and book reading um, so that ultimately they won't, you know, it'll, it's a minor misdemeanor that's happened. Eventually it will, the, um, the incident would be expunged from their record um, when they become adults. So it's really working to divert juveniles away from the system for first time offenses. Um, so I loved being a part of that. I was on CAB in Walla Walla for three years. Um, I also was a volunteer mentor at the Walla Walla Juvenile Justice Center working with incarcerated youth. Um, the facility um, sort of was sim similar in the way that jails were and that you know pe youth were only there for a short period of time. So I worked with youth as young as like 12 or 13 all the way up to 17. But it was kind of a place where they were, they'd either go in for short for a short stay, you know, one to three days, or it was a place where they would go before they were assigned to a juvenile detention facility throughout the state. So that kind of varied. Um, but I found that work to be really important, um, and I enjoyed working with the youth, but found also that, I mean, it's the challenges with all jails, you know, it's a temporary position, so it's hard to build that lasting relationship in some ways. Um, and I guess sort of continuing on in my involvement with juvenile justice and the criminal justice system, I, um, I'm from Portland, Oregon originally, living in Seattle now, loved living in Walla Walla as well, but here I am in Seattle. Um, and uh, when, I was, when I went back home for the summers, um, I worked with Oregon Youth Authority, um, and I was working at McLaren Youth Correctional, working with um, youth leaders there within the, within the juvenile justice system. Um, specifically at McLaren, and they were working to bring in creative rehabilitative programming to their facility, and so I was helping to oversee that. And I specifically worked with, um, with incarcerated youth um, on resume building and thinking about providing resources for when they were transitioned out of the system so that they could have supports they could tap into immediately as they were released. So that was my specific piece there. And then the following year, I worked closely with 
the youth, uh, or sorry, with the family engagement coordinator. Um, and we were working to sort of shift the climate within juvenile justice so that families were seen as an asset and um, sort of seen as someone who could, seen as an entity that could really support their, um, their, their children instead of the typical sort of blame and shame that goes typically in the way that families are treated when they have a juvenile that's incarcerated. So that was working to sort of work within Oregon Youth Authority system um, to change, to shift that. Um, and I worked with a, um, a family advisory council to OIA that um, was, was sort of giving their personal input. They all had children that were incarcerated and they were giving input to the family engagement coordinator in terms of how things could be improved, how relations between um, the officers and the families could be improved, facility improvement changes. Um, so that was a really powerful thing to be involved with. So that's, that's my background with juvenile justice and um, I'm glad to be working and con partnering with the post-prison edu post education program <laughs> um, here in Seattle. You and I talked a lot about stigma and, and so we, you know, Mike, you know, we we meet about an hour before coming over here at the Starbucks across the street. We talk, and so in our office and over there, and, and reading a little bit from Pete Early's book, which I want to talk about uh, before the hour's over, crazy, uh, a father searched through America's mental health mad madness. We were talking about stigma, and, you know, it, in terms of, people who might become prisoners or are prisoners uh, what's the worst problem sometimes I think societies the way society looks at people who suffer mental illness is that is, is almost worse than the diagnosis which I know isn't the case but it's in your mind uh, maybe other than lack of money, lack of funding, lack of treatment. What's the biggest problem that people and families who suffer serious mental illness, what do you see as the biggest problem? I think one of the biggest things, and, and you touched on it as we started to talk about this, is the stigma that when, you know, when someone breaks an arm or has cancer, they're immediately flooded with support. Um, but when someone develops a mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, there's a real distancing. Um, I think there's a lot of fear and there's this, it seems that people just really don't um, understand that there needs to be this sort of wraparound and um, support that comes for those who are suffering with, with mental illness. And yet there's this distancing um, that I think tends to happen in this fear unfortunately I can't figure out why have you figured out why I mean it's like it's, it's you know Pete early in the very beginning of his book uh, I'll tell you a little story about this uh, in 2011 how I met Pete and his book uh, the University of Washington's honors program came down to our office downtown and wanted us to partner with them on a post-prison education program curriculum for winter quarter 2012, which ended up being spectacularly cool because we had 30 UW Honors Program students that were partner matched with 10 of our students. And we took our students, we didn't pick the pansies, so like I, I can, I'm thinking through the you know, there was a guy, there was a guy who did quite a few years, there was two, two people who committed murder, there was a woman who spent 11 years during her last incarceration. These were people with serious criminal records, and here they were partnered with the best and the brightest at UW. And, and we were given the opportunity to pick the professors, to, to write the syllabus, and as part of the syllabus, pick the, pick the textbook. For it. So like the week on mental health, actually what happened, the lady that UW assigned to sort of be the administrator of the class, she didn't even, she, she didn't want to have a week on mental illness. And then I was like, okay, we won't do the program. We're, 
you know, goodbye, <laughs> because that's, that's, to me, that's it, right? And so then we, we, then she backed up, and we ended up with a week on mental illness. Um, and, uh, and, and the textbook that some, I think it was Jenna Melman who worked with us at the time, and is uh, amazing, uh, and is in private practice now, and got her degree at Columbia, and I think it was Jenna that came up with using the book Crazy by Pete Early. And because I had never heard of it, it, came, it was published in 2007, and, but I didn't know the book until we used it at UW winter quarter 2012. And then, and then we got Cheryl Strange, who now is secretary of DSHS. She was the lecturer for that week on mental health. Back then she was deputy secretary of the Department of Corrections and, and her whole background was, was mental health. And so that's how we met this book. And, and met Pete Early, and uh, when, when mental illness became the giant gorilla in the room with Washington's prison system, and it seemed to me that the legislature, the governor, uh, that nobody was even, people aren't even talking about it enough, right? You know, some some things like addiction, the opioid crisis, those things are getting talked about. The fact that we've got almost 50% of our prisoners suffer serious mental illness, according to Department of Corrections statistics, that's just not getting talked about. And if you, if you try to have that conversation with the King County Council or a, a leader at the Washington State Legislature, uh, you, you, I should tell you, you, you you, you have to watch your language here. I have terrible t time because my, my real language is profanity, right? It's, <laughs> my, it's, 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 but but, um, but the, if you, if you want to see a legislator wet his or her pants and flee in the opposite directions, just try to get them to have a serious conversation with you about mental illness. And it's just not going to happen. So... And that's, that's why we decided to do town hall again for the third time. And, um, and then I thought, if we're really going to put mental illness on the front burner and have it be talked about and have the presentation be filmed, who, who will we get? And then I thought about this book. And, I, and, and so Pete Early, uh, just for those who don't know, is, uh, I mean, he was a Washington Post reporter for many years, uh, has written 17 books, uh, Pulitzer Prize nominee multiple times, um, but his son was diagnosed with schizophrenia and, and he left the Washington Post and became what I think is the leading advocate individ as an individual in the nation and has become quite famous. So I thought, I'll, I'll never get him, right? He'll never agree. Uh, to come clear across the country and, and speak, but I sent him an email, told him how I knew about him, talked about the UW Honors Program class, uh, and talked about how we had used the book. And then he, he Googled us. You saw some of this email, and, he's, <laughs> and he saw some of the media attention that we've gotten, and he enthusiastically agreed. And he cut his speaker's fee in half, which was super cool. And um, so that's how, it, so that's how we, it, it, we've come to have Pete be here October 9th, which is a Wednesday, uh, at, at, to keynote this event. And, but in the preface, uh, along the lines of what you were talking about, it was like he says, if my son had broken his leg, most doctors would have agreed on the diagnosis and treatment. Sir, your son's leg is broken into two pieces. The bone needs to be reattached, reattached the wound closed, and the body allowed to heal. But that wasn't happened with Mike, which was his son, uh, because his son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so he got into this quagmire, I guess is a good word. So like one psychiatrist said he had bipolar disorder. Another said he showed early stages of schizophrenia. A third said he had schizoaffective disorder. And so here's this Washington Post reporter who has no experience with any of this, and all of a sudden his son, who's college age, uh, it, 
has his diagnosis and and he's and and then it goes from there but like he ends up talking about the stigma and it's it's like if you if you tell me that you have that you're you've been diagnosed with leukemia you know the whole family gathers around that your next door neighbors bringing over potluck dinner how can we help let me i'll even mow your grass you know you need somebody to pet sit for you when you take you know your son daughter spouse to the doctors whatever when you have mental illness like you said everybody just it's weird it's that they back up and pull away and and you know, embarrassed to talk about it i don't even i mean i can't figure it out mm -hmm. so but it's a large part of why this isn't getting addressed i think and is it because we don't know what to do with it or how to fix it or and I don't have the answer either. I think I think that that's a big question that, that everyone's still trying to figure out. But but one thing that I do really appreciate about being a part of NAMI is that NAMI really works to, to build a community around mental illness and to bring people together who have similar experiences so that they can find support in each other. And I think that, that that's really the first step. And especially with mental illness when, as we've talked about, it's something that people who don't have that experience are are more afraid of than almost anything else it seems. We need to have people who have that lived experience be able to be in community and partnership with each other. And that's that's what I love about NAMI. I think, um, um, I think, this, I think this, there's a solution to this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it has to do with money mm -hmm. and funding and the need is so great that it takes government. Mm -hmm. And 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 somewhere in this book, I was in Pete's book, I was reading. I had to reread this. I hadn't read it since 2012. But I was. This is this was really interesting. So like in 1955, some 560,000 Americans were being treated for mental problems in state hospitals. These numbers are crazy. Between 1955 and 2000. The nation's population increased from 166 million to 276 million. If you took the patient per, per capita ratio in 1995 and extrapolate that on the basis of the new population, you should, you'd expect 930,000 patients in state mental hospitals. But when he started researching this because of his son's involvement, he saw only 55,000. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so then he, he's like, where are the others? And where the others are, there is they're out on the streets, and that's because that's because government disengaged, right, mm -hmm. and and backed up, and instead of getting more deeply involved, they got less involved. And so he 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 writes, uh, you know, nearly three hundred thousand are in. This is two thousand seven, right? Nearly three hundred thousand are in jails and prisons. Another half million are on court ordered probation. The largest public mental health facility in America is not a hospital. It's the Los Angeles County Jail. On any given day, it houses 3,000 mentally disturbed prisoners. And you know what? In Seattle, and it, it drives me crazy, you know, people can go th on I-5 through town, and, and probably most people aren't aware when they pass the King County Jail. I'm, like, super aware of it. You know, so when I go from my house in North Seattle to my office in Soto, if I don't take Link, and I happen to be stupid enough to be on I-5, then I'm passing the jail. And I always think, you know, there's 2,000 people there, and most of them suffer mental, mental illness there. It's abject poverty, addiction, co-occurring disorders, and mental illness, and just extreme poverty. And, um, and so that's... It, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I think I, I think um, we uh, I'm, there's a third part of this that I'm going to read, and then I'll stop reading from the book. But um, and you and I talked about it at Starbucks a little bit ago. It's like you can't do much more than be there for people mm -hmm. that are suffering mental illness. But what you need to do is to be there with money 
so when they when they're hungry you can buy groceries when they when they need a roof over their head um, then you can pay for the rent right and it can be a rent for an appropriate place that can deal with their diagnosis right um, but so being there uh, trust building which is huge uh, but always being on standby being on standby with the resources and and I think that's frankly what's been it's been rewarding and and sad with with the post prison education program so when we've had adequate funding uh, then we're there not only on standby and involved but we're there with with money and we can we can you know somebody has a psychotic breakdown uh, or comes out of prison and just simply needs housing and groceries and bus pass we can we can deliver right but then when you have when we don't have adequate funding then we we're there but we can't deliver and it's almost like what good is it to be there if somebody needs a roof over their head and you can't write a check for it but it's like so uh, that and, and so the, I think the solution is and the problem is the well, I think it's in, in this state. It's the Washington State Legislature. I, I really believe it. It's not the Department of Corrections in my mind. It is the. Uh, it is I'm, okay. I can say this. It is the God be damned King County Council building, uh, the word I can't say, effing jail, to house youth instead of providing programs. Um, but it's not the Washington State Legislature. And it's not the Washington State Department. I mean, it is the legislature. It's not the Department of Corrections. Um, and it's because they're not they're not funding. Uh, and actually, they've uh, and and that's legislative cowardice. That's literally, uh, I think, that's all it is. I think it's the Debbie Regalas and Jeannie Darnells and Roger Goodmans and Larry Springers and Tim Ormsby's of the world who are afraid of being voted out of office if they're not tough on crime, right? And so they won't do the necessary things that, that give entities that, with proven ability the bucks to, to deliver the solutions. And, and so I like, um, I, I loved this when I was reading Pete's book, at the very end of the book, um, he talks about his son Mike and, and 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 just being there so it's like he says mental illness is a cruel disease no one knows whom it might strike or why there's no known cure it lasts forever my son Mike has it and because he is sick he will always be dancing on the edge of a cliff I cannot keep him from falling I cannot protect him from its viciousness all I can do is stand next to him on that cliff always ready to extend my hand um, all I can do is promise that I will never abandon him so that you know that's what we try to do and and but it's like you feel fairly useless if you're standing there like he describes and somebody comes out of prison and they need a roof over their head or they need to be in treatment and you and you can't provide that that second piece and and that's that's what i hope to do with town hall i mean i really i i've, I've been fantasizing there's a big movie screen in town hall so when you come upstairs mike knows this um what when, when you come upstairs into the main auditorium there's a, a movie screen which we can have up or down and i'm literally thinking about having governor jay Inslee's picture on it and a sign over his picture that says public enemy number one and i might put tim ormsby who's in charge of appropriations at the house his picture right there by Inslee, and i might put Inslee's advisor sonia hallam her picture right there and throw roger goodman and Jeannie darnell in the mix and just try to make 800 people fully understand that people are dying 
when it doesn't have to be that way. People are in jail when it doesn't have to be that way. People are in prison when it doesn't have to be that way. Kids are without their parents when it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so now I'm back to you. <laughs> so one thing I'm thinking too is we're discussing what the solution is for this. Um, early intervention is key. Helping people before they get to the place where they're, they've been struggling for years with a serious mental illness that then leads to homelessness and crime and incarceration out of the need to sort of try and self-medicate and self-regulate. The key is really early intervention, and that's why I'm so passionate about my position, working to educate and normalize and destigmatize mental illness and the experience of mental illness among young people. Um, because the sooner that you can get treatment as a young person, the, like right as the, sim as the symptoms begin to have their onset, if you're getting treatment and you're being seen, the likelihood of sort of having this downward spiral of developing a serious mental illness and unhealthy coping mechanisms that then lead to sort of homelessness and, and, and a lot of times crime, addiction, incarceration, you're stopping that at its head. If you can have this early prevention, early education, and work to normalize that experience of mental illness. Um, so I think, I think that's huge. And I think, I mean, I think there's a lot that can also be done for thinking, you know, even before before students are, you know, middle and high school age, thinking about prenatal care, um, supporting families as they're becoming pregnant, making sure that they know how to raise their children in a way that's safe and that they're, because every child, every, every parent wants the best for their kids. Every parent, you know, loves their children and wants to make sure that they're raised to be healthy and successful. And I think there's just such a lack of education um, and a lack of partnership and resources as they're bringing new life into the world and I think that that's a place that really needs to be focused on as well so that sort of early intervention when during pregnancy and, and early birth and then also just this continuing reinforcement of education as children are in their school system having that be part of the curriculum having it be required to teach about mental illness and normalize it I think that's key how do you make that happen and that's the other thing. I mean, so NAMI, you know, NAMI does the best that it can as a, as a nonprofit organization. And we do have, we're lucky in that we have such a, a broad reach across the country. NAMI National is based out of D.C. And then there are state affiliate or state organizations in each state. So every state has a state office. I work for the Washington state office here in um, Seattle. And then within Washington state, we have 19 local affiliates that are loosely tied to the counties. There are more counties than 19, of course, but we have some that cover multiple or um, in the middle of the state we're, you know, where there are less people, we have um, slightly less affiliates per county ratio. But we're trying to cover um, and provide resources, programming and education throughout the state of Washington. And we're just one nonprofit. Um, I think there are others that are doing the same, but um, I think if we can have more partnership um, sort of working to provide our programming throughout the state with support of the government, with support of other nonprofits, um, then we can really work to create a large spread education um, and support that would be really effective and really important for people in their lives. You know, we get um, starting in, uh, I forget what, we, we switched from uh, Google Docs to Salesforce for a database some years ago. Um, I mean, our whole corporation lives in Google Docs or Google Drive, I think, sometimes. It's like it's almost like a house you could walk into and everything's in there. But for the CRM, we use Salesforce now. And we um, have been fortunate enough to be able to work with the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Department of Corrections, um, and WISIP, Washington State Institute for Public Policy, to be able to upload data from the Department of Corrections into our sales force. And, and that ends up being, and so you can look at people's lives as data, but it's really telling, and it can be super sad or super exciting. So like you heard, Mike was with us in Gig Harbor the other day when we had three students speak to about 40 
people from a panel at a, at a dinner. And uh, one student, Keith Whiten was a graduate, so no longer a student. Uh, Jenny Burton uh, is a graduate and a student, so she graduated with honors from South Seattle, but on the 25th of this month, she starts at UW. And then Shalisha Hudson, who's been on the show, is, is a student, you know, freshly out of prison last February. And um, so if you look at them in our data, like with Keith, for example, you, you literally see six imprisonments. And you see uh, what his mental health his S code was, and you see how, what day he went to prison, what day he got out, and you see whether he recidivated or not. And that's all in our sales force. And so you, with line items, you can see a person's life. And uh, so the neat thing is they have four imprisonments, six imprisonments, um, and then they meet the post-prison education program and the insanity stops, right? You put the brakes on it. Uh, or you see somebody who um, is back in prison for the 10th time, and you know that person's diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder, and you know he comes from a... a, a really abject poverty. I talked to this guy's mother. I've talked about this guy on our program before, and I, I don't know whether it's cool to say his, I mean, his name's on the DOC's website, and the, and the information is public, but I'm not going to put it out there. But um, the guy is known by the Department of Corrections to be so seriously mentally ill, he can't make it on his own. Uh, the data shows that. Uh, and he released from prison in 2010 and uh, is now back in prison for four more years. This is his 10th incarceration. It's all over mental illness. But he comes from a family where there's no education, right? And he comes from extreme poverty. And, he, and in terms of what we have in King County, or maybe Spokane has, um, with entities like Navos and, and, and Frontier, Clark County has basic, you might as well say nothing. And so you go, you come out of prison with this horrible diagnosis, and, and you go back to poverty. And I talked to his mother once, because I was just calling trying to check up on him. Um, and it was clear she she didn't she didn't understand schizoaffective disorder and probably and maybe had no chance of ever understanding it. So, so you come out of prison, you go to that. The, your future is written. You know you're pretty much going to spend your whole life in prison, and you're going to probably die in prison. And um, and I'm. I mean, what do you think the solution to that is? Because I think I think that's. That, according to Department of Corrections data, that's at least 39% of Washington's prisoners uh, are, are, have a diagnosis comparable to this guy. And 53% um, of the people that come out are being readmitted with new felony convictions uh, during their lifetime, 33.5% within three years. 70 percent of 70 of them are finding reentry so bad that they commit suicide or overdose within less than two years of their release so I'm, i just don't see any solution other than the washington state legislature and the governor getting deeply involved and I, and i think the way they need to get involved is to fund entities like nami and like post prison education program that have proven abilities and know what they're doing uh, and then step back and so what's your what do you think I mean yeah, it's pretty I, bad yeah it is it is it's horrible and I I think 
I think that, I mean, one thing that I saw from my personal experience sort of working, and this is with juveniles working to um, provide them with supports as they're reentering society, there needs to be, a, I think, and I mean, it's, it's a question of whose responsibility is it to provide that sort of network of support as they exit, but once you're incarcerated, there's so much, not, on, not only if you have a mental illness, but once you're incarcerated, there's so much stigma. It's, it's very difficult to, um, to be able to qualify for renting a home, to get a job. So there's, and you're kind of marked for life with this incarceration. Um, so the recidivism is so rampant because you, you kind of lose access to all these things that everyone else already has, has access to, but because you have this, this stigma and this, um, criminal record, you're denied access. Um, so re-entry is so important, and it's a question of whose whose responsibility is that to sort of, and the post-prison education program is really working to provide that one-on-one -on -one support, but I think, which is amazing and so needed, and we need to have people who are sort of standing side by side people as they're being released, but I also think that there needs to be more, and I don't know if this is DOC or if this is going to be government funded or some other entity that works to provide really intensive wraparound services when someone is released from prison so that they have access to housing and a job and resources, counseling, if, they're, if they have any addiction, support for that as they're being released. And I know we have parole officers, but that's kind of a, that's been sort of a punitive model in that, you know, if you fail your drug test, you're going to be put back into the system. And there's, it doesn't seem like there's really an ability to provide these supportive services as you, as you exit the system. I'm so glad you said that. I just want to make sure I don't goof up this lady's name because I just met her the other day. Yeah. So Scott Frakes is head of the Department of Corrections in Nebraska now, but he had a 30-year career here in Washington State with the Washington State Department of Corrections. And uh, he's an amazing guy. He'll be at town hall, hopefully. I know his wife will be there on October 9th. Um, but uh, he wrote to me a couple months ago and introduced me to a woman named Casey Moyer, K-A-S-E-Y Moyer, and, so, and, and who works for, I think it's Mental Health Association of Nebraska, and she's in charge of it. And, fi and she flew in the other day. I told you about this. I, mm -hmm. I was like, um, this was like super sad and super infuriating when it terms, in terms of what Washington State is not doing but could be doing versus what Nebraska is doing. And so, like, I was like, you know, I, I've always thought, in 1978, I flew into Scotts Bluff, Nebraska on a business trip. I thought I'd landed on Mars. In my, my opinion, all these decades has been Nebraska is like Republican, recalcitrant, conservative, ignorant, whatever. You know, just, just in terms of politics, a horrible place to be that would never fund really super great programs. And I was couldn't have been more wrong. So, like... Uh, after we had lunch uh, together the other day, and then with Casey Moyer, and she, then we went back to the office and we got on Shalisha's computer with the big monitor, right? And Casey showed us two videos, and where she, where one was, um, and I promised to send this to you the other day, and I didn't. I need to, <laughs> and I need to send it to you too. But it's like so. One video is a transition house. That, that her organization has. Uh, and one was like an evening news report where she where she's in, in one of the high security Nebraska prisons with Scott Frakes, working with men who have super serious violent criminal records, right? Um, but the, 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 and very successful in both places. But the point I want to make is that if you're mentally ill in Nebraska, you, co you come out to Casey's organizations, you come out to her organization, and you immediately have a job, and you immediately have a roof over your head. 
She has 45 employees. They're all former prisoners, and they're all mentally ill. So that's how Nebraska is taking care of people who suffer mental illness and, and don't come from wealth, right? You walk out the door into a job, for crying out loud, and then into a transition house that's really nice. It's nicer, nicer than anything I've ever seen with Oxford House or anything else in the state of Washington. And it's paid for by the state of Nebraska. So, like, for all these people that are, like, praising Jay Inslee because he wants, you know, has a climate change policy that's going to kill people 50 years from now or 100 years from now, I'm like the exact opposite. Like, where's Inslee on this where people are dying now where you know and his is is i i I actually almost i should i'm not going to say it i don't have a high regard for his advisor sonia hallam that's that's as nice as i can get it because she's supposedly (coughs) you know finding best best solutions recommending them to the governor and then the governor recommending them to the doc and or at least making the department of corrections aware of these things so, like, you know, where I, I know where DOC is on this. They don't have the money. They don't have the money because it wasn't appropriated by the Washington State Legislature. And, frankly, I know where the Washington State Legislature is. They don't want to get voted out of office for being not being tough on crime. But for crying out loud, and this is obviously a misnomer, but in redneck Nebraska, they've got a great solution. And in and, and Washington State, We've got nothing but death and overdose and suicide, homelessness, and mentally ill people sleeping on sidewalks a block from King County Council and and so on in the financial district of the Emerald City, right? Um, Keith, our our student that you heard the other night at that dinner, works a program called Familiar Faces. He works now with uh, Catholic Community Services in Olympia, in a partnership program with the Olympia Police Department where they deal with 25 or 30 men and women who are the most familiar faces because they're mentally ill, highly addicted, come from poverty, and they're sleeping on the streets. And, and, and so they're working to, down there to get... But, but the point is, there's, the, there's people that, that they see so often homeless on the streets, abject poverty, suffering mental illness, that they, they've got a program called Familiar Faces. In Nebraska, the Familiar Faces would be in a transition house with a job, with a salary, with everything they need paid for by the state. I'm like, why not here? Really, why not here? It's, 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 it. And I'm going to, we got, we got 12 minutes. I told you this would happen. <laughs> and I'm going to shut up and give them all to you. <laughs> right? But But I'm like, I've said this to Tim Ormsby, who's in one email after another and on Facebook posts. And and if you're responsible for, and I said it on the stage of Benaroya Hall two days ago, actually, uh, when if you're responsible for somebody dying, as far as I'm concerned, you're a murderer. And I know everybody just stepped back from their radio and they're like, oh my God, did he really say that? But I think if you're, you make a conscious decision to do something or not do something, result to which somebody dies, then you need to take ownership of that. And so when, when appropriations in Tim Orange Street three years in a row or two years in a row kills a great bill, House Bill 2025, that would have enabled things like what they're doing in Nebraska to happen here in this state, I, as far as I'm concerned, you're a murderer. You know, Patty Murray was in the in the audience that night when I said that from, from, from the stage at Benaroya Hall. I don't know whether she dropped her pocketbook or had a heart attack or or agreed, but 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 that's the way I feel about it. So and and I so I think the solution's there, and I think it's money, and 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 it's also having the courage to kind of like be Harry Truman, and nobody's old enough to even remember who he was, but I do. But and, and like not let the polls and politics, uh, you know, oh, this is politically safe. I can do this. This, you know, I can talk about. I can talk about the climate change. Climate change. That's politically safe, right? I can talk about homelessness. That's politically safe. But I can't talk about support for former adult prisoners. 
because that's not politically safe. That will get me voted out of office. So I, I, I think courage to do, the, do what's necessary, disregard the polls, take actions that are necessary, um, and money. I think those are the solutions. And now you have nine minutes to cover. <laughs> <laughs> so to solve the world's problems. Oh, a big task. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You're being awful quiet, Mike. <laughs> hmm. Well, one of the questions I have is, um, so, uh, Jenny, do you have a sense for how percentage-wise or numbers, how many people are wrestling with mental illness, at least enough to be, um, would be picked up by um, NAMI's radar? That's a good question. I don't have a specific percentage on that specifically. Um, I do have some information specifically regarding youth. Um, so one in five youth has or will develop a mental illness every given year. Um, it's about 20%, 13 to 20% of youth. Um, and youth aged 8 to 15, 50% of those youth that do have a mental illness won't seek treatment. Um, and that's something that we've been talking about, the stigma. Um, and that's how things get to the point where they are today, where it's like we're pulling our hair and we're like, what do we do? Um, because there's this stigma that happens from such an early age um, and this isolation that happens for families that have children with serious mental illness. They, it's hard to find support. And again, I mean, that's, that's really what NAMI can offer and can offer that educational piece so that hopefully as we move forward, um, and, I, and I've seen this too, I've worked in the schools and I feel like the students now of today are a lot more aware of mental illness. It's more in their vocabulary, more in their vernacular. They kind of know what it is. Um, I wouldn't, I think there's still some stigma surrounding it, but the fact that it's being talked about more than ever before is promising. And the fact that schools are seeking these mental health educational resources is promising. And I mean, change, unfortunately it takes time and and changing this requires such a big cultural shift in the way that we understand mental health and the way that we interact with people um that exhibit mental health symptoms um it's a big shift that is sort of on the way um but it's frustrating to, to see that it takes as much time as it does especially when people are dying now and people need help now and their and you know services are sort of in some ways few and far between um we need more mental health providers within Washington state, especially in places that are more rural. Um, within Seattle, I mean, we're even at a deficit here in a huge city and think about, you know, throughout Washington state, there's places that don't have really many resources at all and you have to drive a really long ways in order to seek help and, and get care. Um, so I don't know if I have a specific solution it's just I mean it, it does take time I feel like the program that I'm overseeing in terms of education and also all the support work that NAMI does is a good step in the right direction um, and so that's that's been really encouraging but it's easy to feel sort of disillusioned by the state of the way things are now um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that that this shift I think is happening um, and again you know it'll just it'll take the time but it's, it's good to know that there are people who are sort of working to create um, a platform for this. Um, Have, are you familiar with the, the different um, like Medicare for all programs that are being floated by different presidential candidates, you know, an all encompassing um, government supported uh, healthcare system, would that address a lot of these issues, do you think? without knowing all the fine details in, in any of them? I think, I think having medical care for everyone is, is very important, um, and that would be a good step in the right direction. Another thing that I feel that is a really great um, sort of movement in Washington State is to have school-based health centers. So having the care in the schools is yeah, vital, yeah. and the fact that there's also this big effort to have integrated care, so where you, where you can get primary medical care, you can also get mental health medical care having those entities within the one and the same. And the school-based mental health programs are working to provide both physical care and mental health care. Um, so I think that's an amazing model that's trying to, that's sort of working its way throughout Washington State. Where does that stand now? I, I had not heard of that. That's amazing. Mm. Yeah. 
I think, I mean, some, I know some schools already do have mental health um, centers within them. It isn't sort of everywhere within Washington State, but there are initiatives to have school-based health centers within Washington schools. Um, and that there's a lot of momentum towards that. So I think within the next, you know, five to 10 years, it'll be common to have mental health centers within schools. Uh, one last quick question for me to squeeze in before the f last four minutes disappear. So Ari, you've read uh, Mr. Early's book, um, which I have not read. Um, I'll leave in, this with you. In, in 1955, um, did the U.S. have, were they keeping up with the mental health issue or were we still um, gravely behind on what we needed to do? Because you were quoting numbers from... I, I think what he said, I think the way I read what he wrote in his book is that we were and I think that we continued until about the early 80s and that's when you know everybody wants to say Ronald Reagan destroyed mental health and it's true you know I, it was uh, when Cheryl Strange spoke to our UW honors program class in 2012 she talked about it and at the time a gal Megan Hammond was our policy director and development director in the law school asked me to come speak uh, and I could speak on anything I wanted to it was kind of cool nobody ever gives nobody has a, is stupid enough to say all right you can come talk and we'll let you say anything you want like most people have, would never say that but anyways the, the law school let, let me do that so I got to decide what I wanted to talk about so I decided I told Megan research this thing that everybody's always talking about with Reagan and so she did and that's what and, and it, so it's true in the uh, in the early 80s Reagan created the, the I don't even know what the situation that we're faced with right now which is uh, people uh, the jails are 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 the largest mental health centers and 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 jails and prisons um, you know they're not they're not equipped they're not funded they're not equipped their staff isn't trained for it uh, and so people that are mentally ill go to prison mentally ill and they come back and they're released mentally ill and you get exactly what you expect so I, I think we were probably as good as we've ever been when Pete wrote those numbers and I think it all came to a screeching halt in 1982 and it hasn't been fixed since. I mean, to the point the, the federal government's suing the state of Washington for X billion dollars, right? Um, and, and, you know, I don't know what else to say. All right, we've got uh, just about a minute left. Jenny, can you tell people uh, how they can find out more about your organization? Yeah, so if you're interested in learning more about NAMI, um, you can check us out at um, www.namiwa.org. Um, that's our state website. Um, so feel free to go there if you're interested in finding support. If you're someone who has mental illness yourself or you're a family member of someone with mental illness, we have support groups for both families and peers. Um, if you're interested in the Ending the Silence program, you can reach out to me, um, Jenny Gruenberg, Youth Outreach Coordinator at NAMI Washington, and I'll be happy to give you more information about that. All right, and Ari, how can people find out more about your organization and the upcoming event? Uh, on our fa Facebook post-prison education program, we've got the October 9th town hall event up. Uh, what, uh, town hall's putting it up on their website. Uh, it's... Uh, Do people need to reserve tickets? Tickets are five bucks, but uh, if you don't have the five bucks and you're interested in this issue, Come on down. Um, if you're a student at UW and you got student ID, if you work for Google, uh, come on down to show your ID. If you're a student at Seattle U, come on down uh, and and and, uh, uh, and listen to Pete. He'll keynote. His keynote will go about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a, a really distinguished panel, including Jenny. Uh, and uh, Hopefully, it'll be, it'll, it'll be a good evening. All right. And Post Prison Education website is postprisonedu.org. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. 
All right. Well, we will uh, see you next month, first Thursday of the month. Thank you. Which will be right before your, your big event. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you both for coming in. Yeah, thank you.